Okay, so I think that that's what we all want for family doctors and primary care and family medicine. So, I mean, every, I think everyone, when I, I'm by no means the best person to explain about this, but I think uh, when you see this kind of diagram, everyone relates. You know, we do all this, we're in the center of this, we see this every day. Um, public health, home and community services, long-term care, hospital services, specialists, and we have the community resources and social services, and of, of course the person itself and its fam and their family and all their supports. So, you know, we're in this kind of loop and it triggers us every day about what we're doing and we're trying to increase the quality of what we do um, on a daily basis. So that's where I think looking into all that and looking into, I mean, the um, education uh, effort of Wonka, uh, we go into education and the family doctors. And I mean, I think we do this, everybody does this on a daily basis, educating the patients on anything. This is just, this is not an exhaustive list. It's um, what is close to me, I guess, and what I see every day um, based on my experience. So acute illnesses, all these non-communicable diseases, children and education and the underprivileged. And as a lecturer myself, I do see students. Um, some of them become our, our doctor students doing their postgraduates, and some of them are actually patients as well. And I think knowledge just doesn't go one way, it goes both ways as well. It's something very fluid and very dynamic. And I learn from everyone every single day. So, I mean, I think a lot of us do this as well. We actually educate the public on, on, on uh, different platforms. And I think since COVID happened, um, we've been very active online. And um, there was, for example, something that I wrote um, in when I was a trainee, um, lecturer training family medicine in family medicine and a lot of the patients were um, worried about their kidneys uh, because they were taking yeah, yeah, yeah. Thing, uh, in, in other countries but it is in Malaysia mm. and we do talk a lot about hypertension okay. because I think um, we see the majority of hypertensive cases and so we actually get referred hypertensive cases uh, even uh, from a tertiary level um, most of the time. So the, another, just another uh, initiative that um, we do as well in, um, this is one of my NGO healthcare um, efforts and it's called the Chadibi Hospital. I'm not sure if anyone's familiar with it, but we do this in Malaysia. There's a QR code, you could probably scan that and just save it for later to have a look. But basically what we do is we uh, hold a pretend play where children will bring in their teddy bears and medical students are doctors. And we use that as kind of like a platform to educate uh, children in that. So of course uh, we do teach um, our patients, but in order to be able to give quality kind of uh, education or quality information, we have to have research because it's always very you know changing and it's uh, evolutionizing if that's a word and information changes and the way we present it change as well so there's a little diagram that I did that I just you know just it goes hand in hand and among the things that we apart from teaching the patients we do support each other uh, in terms of management as I mentioned earlier on in terms of uh, our patients we also um Social media is a big thing here in Malaysia. I don't know about the rest of the world, but I think there it is. Um, I've been looking through that. Social media for patients, social media for doctors themselves, acute illnesses. A huge thing that I think that should be looked more into is doctors' health and well-being, because I think that good doctors um, bring out better education, uh, education and also healthcare to the public, and also looking after the junior doctors or the the ones that are doing our steps as well. And this includes students as well. And students are really big in social media as well. And I do teach them uh, my specialty, which is uh, my interest, which is uh, hypertension. So um, I was trying, I was asking my colleagues in education department, what kind of thing do they think resonates with what we do in primary care and what we do as healthcare professionals? And she said, well, maybe it's because we don't really learn this formally, um, but um, we actually do it without recognizing it that if it makes sense so one of the things to theory that she um, suggested was interest-driven creative theory so if you saw that I, I listed out a, a list of things that I was involved in and I'm sure that you guys are also involved in and can relate to it's something that 
what we do, what we educate and what we look into or do research perhaps is what interests us. And the, the theory goes is something that triggers you first. So something that makes you more curious and likes it. And when you like something or you're curious about it, you learn better. And then the next step is immersing yourself into it and you know, uh, learning the activities um, that gives that person full, full attention. Or when we're teaching, we try and make that person to be immersed uh, in the activities. And of course, extending it, you know, um, do, doing more activities and extending it, and then it goes in a full loop circle. So I don't know about anyone else, but when uh, I became a postgraduate student, I think I learned better I think it interested me more than when I was a medical student because we are actually doing it um, on a day-to-day -day basis and we want to improve ourselves constantly. So another thing that she, uh, my, my colleague kind of helped me with was she showed this thing called the cone of learning. And you can see at the very bottom, 90%, after two weeks, we tend to remember things that are 90% of what we say and do. So I think a lot of things that we do is because we are actually immersed in it, as I mentioned earlier. So, so when we learn from that, it tends to stick to us. And we remember this when we're actually teaching to other people, our, our juniors, and also our patients. Okay, I think that's all about the theory that I, I'll go into. I won't bore you more uh, on the details of that. But um, just going through my personal experience and, and what I, I've been doing, and I hopefully um, get some uh, dialogue later on. Um, I, as I mentioned, uh, I'm a family medicine specialist, so I do actually do some um, uh, in GPs and also public uh, government health centers. Um, but um, we also have a hospital and our hospital is lucky enough to have primary care there. Um, medical lecturer, I do teach undergraduates, uh, masters in family medicine as well, and um, a parallel pathway, which is like an examination which is called the FRCGP uh, in Malaysia. I help with um, the research module there. And I'm also a healthcare uh, NGO activist. Um, some of the associations that I'm with are here and I've uh, been associated with this as well. Um, I'm also advisor to projects, which is a training program for junior doctors as well. So some of the research that um, I've uh, done is obviously um, type 2 diabetes and hypertension, as I mentioned earlier on. So for, for example, type 2 diabetes, um, uh, I look into social support and self-efficacy. And I think that's what we as doctors uh, in primary care, a lot of that uh, we do, whereby social support is really important in terms of um, things in behavior as well. I think we do a lot with behavior. So self-efficacy is the confidence of somebody doing, um, or the confidence of uh, them um, carrying themselves uh, in the disease, if, that's, if that makes sense. So I, when I looked into these factors and they do, they're interconnected social support and self-efficacy in type two. So when we deal with the patients, we think about that more or look into that more. The other thing that interested me uh, as a, a young mother and a junior doctor was breastfeeding practice. And of course we found that um, support and, and we looked into the support that they were given in the workplace and how their self-efficacy was in terms of breastfeeding and of course that that had a very positive relation and that was one of the things that we found out um here's another project that we did um in terms of um you know looking into our practice uh, there was uh when i was a junior doctor we talked a lot about you know um urti uh, symptoms and how when do we treat it with antibiotics and things like that and one of the scoring that we use was center scoring uh, or this throat score and we noticed it's been used in countries outside of Asia so we did it in Malaysia and we found that it was it was quite a good tool to be used uh, in Malaysia so we had it uh, for that as well uh, another one that uh, we did or my group did was um, making an app and ever since COVID happened, people are more tech savvy now. We, we interviewed um, patients, we interviewed healthcare professionals, but what they thought was a good app to screen. And I, I found, uh, we found really interesting things to look into when develop, developing an app. Um, working with the underprivileged, we did open clinics uh, with refugees. And this was one on diabetes and how the doctors, if their doctors, stuck to the 
get guidelines. And of course, this wasn't just to kind of audit the doctors, uh, but actually to raise awareness. It was one of the ways that we did. And of course, we found that those with, who stuck, those that were managed uh, stick with by sticking to the guidelines um, had better HbA1c levels. Uh, but of course, we had very, a lot of limitations. For example, we didn't have enough medications and things like that. Uh, but uh, since then, we've had great support and we ha already have a refugee clinic uh, going on. So that's one of the things I think that's one of the things that helps in terms of uh, when we do research and we look into things like this. Another one was um, antimicrobial in, with children uh, of uh, refugees as well. And we found that age and BMI were associated with infections and the most um, antimicrobials that we gave were actually deworming, which were albendazole. So that I think that was no surprise there. Um, I, as I mentioned earlier, uh, social media and primary care, we try and educate each other and share experiences. Uh, it's something that I think everyone struggles with. And um, we've tried to you know, bring out awareness out there on how to do that and what, what uh, we can do as doctors. So we've written a few articles. This is uh, by, um, this is Malaysian family physician uh, by the AFPM and they've, they've uh, published our article in terms of social media and primary care. Um, another one that we did was, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the, the teddy bear hospital. So we wanted to look into if teddy bear hospital was a good way. Of course, we knew personally it was a good way. So we thought we'd look into all different articles and we did a systematic review of different teddy bear hospitals and their outcomes. And we found that it did help with uh, um, health outcomes and well-being. And when we do this, we learn from different uh, ways of people doing it. And also we're more confident in what we do. And when we promote it, um, we have, you know, like science and evidence. Yes, to back Dr. Anita, you have lost uh, two minutes. Okay, thank you so much. So, um, and then the other step that we did was we thought that they, this was a very good kind of platform to teach on prevention of sexual abuse. And we did studies on that. Uh, don't forget our junior doctors. Um, we did a research on uh, how house officers from medical students can actually um, be more prepared to be doctors. We found that there was a loophole and although I'm in education in the universities, you know, things don't change so quickly. So we did a, a separate training program with via NGO and training programs. And we did an intervention, especially those that traveled overseas, uh, were studying overseas. And we found this, uh, we did a study because people were asking us what was the evidence. And of course, um, we found that it was effective. Last but not least is the prevalence, lots of road crash with doctors. So we looked into it and we found significant results uh, about doctors and road crash, especially if you're single, junior and working overtime. And we found that if you nap, you're two times more or less likely to be involved in a road crash injury. So these are just ideas that I want to put out there that, that that I, what I've been doing so far. And I hope to get some dialogue um, from, from this group, um, hopefully. Uh, here are my, uh, is my email and my contacts, and I hope um, uh, I did okay with um, the presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Anita. I am so thankful. I am so thankful for you for this wonderful session and this uh, Thank you, Dr. Anissa. I am so thankful uh, for you for this wonderful uh, session and this uh, wonderful information. Uh, can we uh, start now with the second speaker? Dr. Helen, Dr. Helen Jan, a scientific assistant at the Department of Family Medicine, uh, Sirland University, Hamburg, Germany. Dr. Helen, are you ready? Can you see my slides now? Yes. Okay, then we can get going. Uh, thank you for uh, inviting me to speak here. Um, I want to present to you a little study that we did um, that also has to do with education in primary care. Um, and uh, we focused on specialty training and how young general practitioners want their specialty training to be. 
So that's me and some other colleagues that uh, unfortunately cannot be here today, but I will present to you everything that we did. So uh, at first I will give you some information on what the trainers um, and institutions think about how specialty training for GPs or young GPs should look like. Um, as you all know, Wonka is the World Organization of Family Medicine Doctors, and in Europe there's also something called EUREACT, and that's the European Academy of Teachers in General Practice. So they focus on guidelines on how GPs should uh, go through their training and what they should learn. Um, so we uh, focused on a paper that was published in 2018 by um, the researchers uh, Michael Smagat and others. And they kind of summarized um, all information that was out there um, published by UREC and Wonka on how GP spe specialty training should look like. So they kind of um, summarized the trainer's perspective on this topic. And we were wondering, um, yeah, what do GPs, so the people that are in training, think about this? This is the Wonka tree. You probably saw seen this before. Um, it just focuses on the qualities that uh, a GP should acquire during the training. So we have person-centered care, for example, or um, yeah, specific problem-solving skills. So these are all things that uh, you should be able to do when you finish your GP training. And they are all based on these three roots you can see in the bottom, attitude, science, and context. So this is basically what was already out there when we started um, doing our study. We used a method called the Delphi method. Um, so it's a yeah, qualitative research method um, where a small group of experts is asked on a topic multiple times. And by this, uh, you try to get a consensus on a certain topic. So at first we were starting out on um, the conference of the European young family doctors movement. So that's EYFDM. And they usually do pre-conferences for the Wonka conferences in Europe. So this one was in Edinburgh. And here we do, did a discussion among 30 um, experts and the experts were young GPs or GPs that were in specialty training. So they had to be in specialty training or within five years after that training. And we did an online word cloud where we asked them, what do you think are the most important competencies that you want to acquire in your training? And we sorted them by categories, namely psychomotor, the, this is everything that you do with your hands, cognitive, this is what you do with your head or what you learn, and then effective is more like the emotional side or empathy, understanding others. This was the first round of our study. Then we did a second round online with the online tool Qualtrics one month later. And here we sent um, a summary of the workshop results to our participants and asked them to rank the competencies by their importance. So they should put the most important thing first and then least important thing last. And um, yeah, we try to keep the same group of experts as it is recommended in this Delphi method. And then the last step was in last summer, um, again at a pre-conference for a Wonka conference Wonka Europe in London in July. And here we had a presentation of the previous results. And then we um, had an open discussion again with the experts. And then we did a re-ranking on site using um, the tool Slido. So that's an online voting tool where people can vote with their mobile phones in real time. And the hope is that we can publish these results. So the voices of uh, young GPs are actually heard and implemented into the uh, specialty training design. Here's a little map of where the participants came from. So as all the conferences were in Western Europe, <laughs> you can see it's a bit Europe centered. And um, that's also one of the limitations of our study. We had some participants from like Eastern European countries, but most of them were from Western European countries. So the numbers are the numbers of participants in the different rounds. So you can see, for example, France and the UK are countries that are very strongly rep represented, whereas some other, other countries in Eastern Europe are not re represented at all. So that's a limitation. 
Um, now to the interesting part, the results. Um, at first, I present you the psychomotor competencies that the European GP trainees that we asked uh, thought were most important in training. So at first we have the general physical examination. Of course, this is very basic. Um, without the physical examination, we cannot do anything. Then we have specific examination. So techniques from ENT or orthopedics, um, for example. Then we have diagnostic tools. So that would be ECG or spirometry or um, stuff like that. Then we have interventional skills that could be something like wound care or joint injection. So yeah, very hands-on skills. Then we have interestingly documentation and digital skills, digital skills. So how to deal with a computer since computer and digital uh, documentation are becoming more and more important in Europe. This is also something that uh, GP trainees wanted to learn about. And last but not least, we have um, on-site diagnostics, for example, ultrasound. This is the results for the cognitive uh, competencies. So the first point is maybe not that clear. Individual, individualized care means that uh, people want to learn how to take guidelines and then use them on um, an individual patient with different um, pre-existing conditions. Um, so it's really about how to apply this to like my patient. The second thing, medication and prescribing is pretty clear. So we want to learn about um, medication, side effects, uh, and so on. The third point is basically everything that you learn in a textbook. So um, for example, what uh, blood pressure should someone have or um, how much should someone weigh, like numbers and that kind of stuff. Then we have mental health skills, how to deal with someone that has mental health issues, how to discover them, how to treat them. Then we have imaging interpretation, um, especially in the countryside can be useful to interpret X-ray or something like that without having to ask a radiologist. Then we have health systems and finance. How does the health system work in my country? Where can I send my patient? What will it cost to the patient, for example? And this last point is, uh, I think, also caused, caused by COVID. Um, that people want to learn about infectious diseases. Now we come to the last uh, category, which are effective competencies. Of course, the most important thing is communication skills. So for example, also breaking bad news or um, motivational interview would be this uh, topic. Then we have establishing a good doctor-patient relationship. It's also really important to learn. Then we have, interestingly, managing one's own well-being. So um, a bit like work-life balance, how to um, not burn out, basically, while being a GP. And um, the last ones are, for example, um, qu clinical quality improvement. How do I provide uh, better care in my practice when I have someone that I don't get along with, for example? Teamwork and time management, also very important in a GP practice. And the last one is sensitivity toward differences. For example, being sensitive with topics like gender or patients from different cultural backgrounds. Um, so we found basically that some of these topics are also represented in the um, publications by Wonka. So the things that GP trainees want aren't that far away from what Wonka suggests. But we felt like, or the data show, showed that, especially the area of effective competencies, so um, communication skills and also taking care of oneself are not very much covered in GP training in Europe yet. So it would be nice to have this covered a little bit more. And we also wanna keep the study going and um, have some follow-up research, especially on effective competencies planned for uh, Wonka conferences in Brussels and also in Sydney. And the last thing in Sydney would be especially interesting because we could include other areas of the world as well, because right now we're still very Europe centered, but um, would be interesting to see what young GPs from other countries or areas of the world think. Yes, so some references and Thanks very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Hill.
many thanks for uh, this wonderful information. Uh, anyone have a question? Thanks, Dr. Helen. Many thanks to you. And then we, we can start with uh, Dr. Fajdan um, Bolatito Betty. Dr. Bola, are you ready? Yes, I am. Yes, here you are. Can I share my screen? How will it be projected from there? Yes, please, Dr. Aydin. Um, Dr. Abola, you can you can just share it. You have the share from. Oh, thank you. Can everyone uh, see my screen now? Yes, Dr. You, you can proceed. Just put it in presentation mode and go on. Okay. Oh, uh, greetings, everyone. Um, want to appreciate. Uh, Good. Dr. Abola, oh. sorry to interrupt. If you can just put the presentation mode on, the F5 okay. one. Yeah. All right. Okay, is it better now? Yes, that's great. Thank you very much. Oh. So greetings, uh, everyone from Nigeria. Um, and I want to appreciate the previous speakers for giving the perspectives about family medicine postgraduate training in their uh, countries. So uh, I'll be speaking on behalf of um, Sub-Saharan Africa. And, um, knowing fully well that Africa is a, a continent of about 54 countries. And presently we have a, a family medicine training uh, going on in about uh, 13 to 14 countries uh, presently. So I will be presenting the challenges of uh, the training across countries um, and some way forward that's uh, was suggested by trainers and trainees alike. So um, family medicine is making a significant progress across Africa. It's uh, no longer a new specialty, uh, but uh, the growth has not be, been in leaps and bounds, but uh, the growth has been significant. And um, as common to every evolving a new program, uh, family medicine program uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa have recognized strengths and challenges which did across uh, countries and training centers. So I, I would like to start uh, by making reference to uh, this report of Wonka uh, from Wonka Africa Conference um, in Uganda in 2019. Uh, then there was a mini study conducted uh, um, with the conference at attendees to what the status of family medicine postgraduate training uh, is, is like in their present countries. So from the reports of that 2019, um, we, could, um, we could see that South Africa, Nigeria, and Ghana, uh, these three countries have well-established postgraduate programs. And in fact, Nigeria alone has above uh, 500 family medicine fellows with above 50 um, training centers. And uh, Kenya too, has um, two established uh, training institutions, and three that are still upcoming. And uh, Rwanda uh, started training in 2000, uh, uh, trained residents between 2008 and 2012, after which uh, uh, this was stopped. So they are still back to drawing board to see 
uh, when they can recommence family medicine program in the country. And uh, likewise, in Sierra Leone, um, as at present, there are residents, but uh, they are having challenges with uh, a stable family medicine trainer as at last year, hoping that uh, by this year, things would have improved. And so um, uh, other countries like Niger, Guinea-Bissau, they are still contemplating of having um, family medicine training. In Tanzania, family medicine training is offered in private sector uh, uh, in a network of health facilities attached to Aga Khan University. Uh, but uh, yet the government uh, doesn't support the medicine in public uh, sector yet. Uh, Zimbabwe, uh, in the early stage of implementing the postgraduate family medicine uh, program, DRC is a French speaking African country. And uh, so they, they have like two challenges. The first is like, um, um, to blend with other countries who are uh, uh, English speaking and do maybe collaborative um, work in research and all that has not been uh, easy for them. Uh, though some of them try to learn uh, English language to um, subvert this challenge, uh, they uh, have one university training family medicine uh, residents in postgraduates and uh, one big challenge they have as at 2019 uh, was um, with retention of family physicians because uh, the family physicians trained in DRC um, move out of the country to uh, South Africa. So that's a big challenge. A uh, few, uh, like a week or two prior to this presentation, I, I did a mini survey among young doctors uh, across Sub-Saharan Africa to know the present challenges that are ongoing in different countries and their training uh, centers. And we could see here the respondents uh, from six Sub-Saharan African countries, Nigeria, Zimbabwe, Zambia, Ghana, Botswana, and Sierra Leone were represented. And uh, among uh, the respondents, we have people who have already finished their postgraduate training and are still within uh, the first five years. Uh, we have those who are still undergoing training as senior residents, as junior residents, and uh, in some countries, instead of uh, running residency program, they are running masters in family medicine. So we have uh, uh, such um, people also among the respondents. And we have a few people who are already uh, doing their PhD in family medicine. So uh, I, I try to know what the current status of the challenges uh, of postgraduate training uh, across Sub-Saharan Africa is, and this is the result I got from the mini study, um, the mini survey I did. So I grouped this into two. The challenges seems to be like um, countries have like almost identical uh, challenges, though some problems are more prominent in, uh, in some countries than, than the others. So uh, the problems uh, were like grouped into two, the health system challenges and the challenges are from um, the individual training institutions. Um, among uh, the challenges identified um, on the health system, in Ghana, um, respondents reported that family medicine is being underrated by non-family medicine physicians. Like when the trainees are undergoing uh, clinical rotations under the linear specialist, 
uh, they look down on them. They feel like oh, their specialty is not really a specialty and all that. And so that is uh, one challenge the residents are facing in that country. Across country, uh, there is increased cost of training because um, family physicians are poorly remunerated uh, in, in most African countries. The pay is very low and uh, with the inflation, the global economy melts down, which affected countries also across Africa. Uh, the cost of training has increased and uh, likewise the risk of training because um, taking, for example, Nigeria, there is a lot of insecurity and that equally affects um, training of uh, family physicians. Uh, due to some peculiar challenges in some countries like Nigeria, uh, residents are experiencing longer duration of training. Average uh, year for training a family uh, physician in Nigeria is usually around, um, uh, like around four to six years. But um, some other factors which uh, could range from uh, like um, strike actions and all that tends to extend the duration of training of residents and it's making people really lose uh, interest. Uh, likewise, uh, there is the challenge of core funding across most uh, of health sector, in most of the countries that responded and uh, uh, most of some health systems don't really understand uh, the importance of family medicine yet. Uh, that could um, explain why uh, some country are still hesitant in um, uh, adopting family medicine as um, a postgraduate uh, program. And a big challenge that I want to emphasize a little is what uh, in Nigeria is being referred to as Jaqua syndrome. And that's a coinage for brain drain, which is really, really intensive. Uh, uh, presently, people just want to go out, just want to get out of the country. So in my training center, for example, uh, the senior residents we have presently, uh, who we are hoping that uh, we could train and become family physicians, about 50% of them are already writing foreign uh, medical exams to uh, move out maybe in the next few months or within the next year. So that is really a big challenge, threatening the sustenance of family medicine. Uh, in uh, in the country, because uh, if this is not uh, uh, curbed, it's going to really lead to a death of uh, family physicians across the country, and that will worsen uh, the health outcome, especially at primary care level. And uh, from training institutions uh, in Ghana, um, they have the challenge of uh, not really having a well-structured learning resources. Uh, Sorry, the open that open that that will uh, soon be um, be be over. That problem will soon be over because as, as at now, got two minutes remaining for you. I'm sorry. Okay, so let me let me quickly just run through. These are the challenges. Um, limited hands on experience from Nigeria, burnouts from excess clinical workload, poor mentoring, and inadequate number of tra trainers, uh, change in policy, poor communication between trainees and trainers. So we could see the other challenges highlighted. And uh, among this, uh, Challenges of balancing clinical workload with academic workload is something that um, is happening across uh, countries. Some 
reported lack of clarity on what the scope of family practice is and uh, inadequate um, surgical exposure. These are some quotes from the respondents. Um, some uh, a, a respondents from Nigeria reported that they are exposed to multiple key roles at once and they are being overextended beyond what other specialists would normally be asked to do uh, just because um, it's a family medicine resident. And uh, um, some, somebody, some a respondent from Zambia said, uh, some vertical specialists poorly understand the program and thus uh, the assessment may not include um, the formats for family medicine. So uh, th th those are the challenges. Um, now, way forward uh, for health system, I, I, I think advocacy about the role and importance of family medicine to policymakers will help. Um, trainers of faculties in different countries uh, could um, step up the advocacy role uh, to and not give up, keep pushing for family medicine uh, until it is well accepted by policymaker. Uh, another challenge, if there is better remuneration for uh, physicians that could uh, of the problem of poor remuneration. Uh, if more doctors are employed um, from the private sector, that could also help. Uh, if uh, some general hospitals, um, in most African countries, we have what we call general hospitals, that's like a free uh, care level. If such hospitals are converted to family medicine, uh, training institutions could um, uh, make training uh, of family postgraduate training to be all solely under family physicians and not necessarily pushing them out to uh, sub specialists to train. And uh, another thing that could help is uh, when trainees are involved in planning training programs, uh, it's good. Um, help restructure uh, the program because um, if decisions were made without the trainees' input, that could um, not favor the trainees in a way. So, and if there are sp soft specialties in all the disciplines uh, which are under family medicine. If trainers have soft specialties in all those disciplines like surgery, O and G, dermatology, you know, medicine, uh, that could equip them to better train um, more uh, postgraduate uh, students. So uh, other suggestions is to have stipulated but monitor research this. Presently, from my experience here, there is no a day dedicated to uh, research in most training institutions in Africa. So uh, the clinic workload is quite much, and that is just, not. Yeah. Time is running. Uh, Your time is running okay. out. I'm sorry. All right. So uh, like to, those are the the highlighted uh, way forward. So I quickly just want to say that the Working Party on Education actually is ready to support any training institution or country that is having all those challenges. So uh, faculties uh, in those countries can work hand in hand with the Working Party on Education and uh, uh, try to collaborate and overcome all the challenges that have been listed. So I think I should put here all the links for the resource for the Wonka Working Party on Education for anyone that uh, uh, think uh, this could be 
helpful for them. So uh, I'd like to conclude by saying that though family medicine is growing in sub-Saharan Africa countries, but there are several challenges threatening the quality of the postgraduate training. And uh, if uh, there is need to improve the quality of training so that the quality of care in the region can improve. So stakeholders should work together to identify these challenges. So um, these are few as resources, studies that form uh, the basis for this presentation. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bola. Thank you very much. Anyone have any question? Many thanks, Dr. Bola, for this uh, valuable information. Dr. Maron, are you ready? Uh, yes, of course. Um, I need to share my screen if it's possible. Yes, just start sharing, Claudia. Yeah. Dr. Maron, you can just share. Uh, I have another device, so. Okay. Okay. Yes. Mm, hello, everyone. Uh, greetings from Jordan. Uh, I'm Dr. Maram Smirat, a family medicine resident. Um, and thank you for having me today on this webinar. So I will start talking about some challenges that we face, uh, especially in Jordan and in the Middle uh, East region. And I think it's the same that everybody face uh, with the family medicine speciality um, around the world. So uh, in my slides, uh, you won't say, uh, see any um, sentences or words. I just share some samples and I will let you uh, think what everyone uh, and each of them uh, means to you and your country and your region. So uh, the challenges we face and we were facing since we were medical students and now as a resident and a specialist, uh, I think it's uh, the same, uh, the main uh, challenges are uh, the lack of resources at the first place. Uh, especially as the family medicine specialist is a comprehensive speciality. So uh, we uh, need to know more every time. We need to read more. We need to uh, expand our knowledge in many fields as it's a general speciality. Uh, and that's what make it distinguished and that's what make it unique. But at the same time, that's what make it challenging and uh, difficult for uh, all of us, I think. And being a family medicine uh, physician, you need to build up more of your skills in communi communication skills in your counseling um, and uh, how to build your doctor-patient relationship more uh, that you will be the person your patient will return to every single time he needs to see a physician and after he sees other specialties as well. So you need to be there and you need to be always ready to uh, respond with your knowledge and your skills to uh, your patients, uh, regardless how old are they, regardless what gender are they and how many and which medical conditions they have. So these are 
some of the challenges that we deal with as a family medicine uh, specialist and physicians. Uh, so other thing that we, uh, we need to always think and see the patient as a whole, uh, not like other specialties who uh, like think in some systems and some organs and some uh, diseases, but being a family medicine uh, puts uh, pressure on you that to always see your patients as a whole and to treat it as a whole. So uh, in Jordan here, family medicine speciality is somehow it's still a growing speciality and a new field. Uh, we are still discovering the best way to uh, practice it here in their community. Uh, and uh, we still don't have an enough number of uh, family uh, physicians, but it's still growing and uh, many uh, enrolling in this field uh, in the recent years and hopefully in the upcoming years. Uh, one of the challenges as well is that it's not uh, really a well-known speciality for the community. Many of them still, uh, they um, misunderstand or they understand uh, in a, a lack of understanding the importance of family medicine and its role in the community. So we see many patients still don't know what we really do and what we really um, provide as a family medicine uh, doctors in uh, the society and in the community. So we still need to uh, do more awareness and campaigns to make this uh, more clear and more understandable for the community and for the society. So, uh, and uh, the family medicine is uh, looking at the person as individualized. So this makes uh, stress on uh, the family doctors to see each patient from another perspective, uh, to treat it as uh, an, um, as it is another from any other uh, patients uh, who might have the same complaint or the same uh, diseases that he might have. So uh, these are some of the challenges that we might uh, face and um, in any region uh, around the world. Now let's come to the solutions. Uh, and the bright uh, part of the family medicine is like, although it's a comprehensive, individualized um, speciality, but that's uh, one of its distinguished features as we always read, we always search for new informations, we always update our knowledge. Um, that might reach us to a point that uh, burned out for the physicians, but it's still encouraging them to know more and to practice more, to improve their skills and their knowledge. And one of the solutions I might uh, suggest that to always search, always there is something new to learn, always there is something new to know. So these are some of the suggestions I might get for the residents are seeing this uh, webinar or watching uh, this webinar and for the medical students who are interested in family medicine. So always search, always read, always updates your uh, knowledge and always search for the new guidelines and approaches. Uh, and you will see amazing things each time. Uh, so the other solution is to always ask always ask for help, always ask for, if you have any question you don't know, so we, we are all learning in this process uh, from your colleagues, from the same speciality or other specialities, from your seniors, from your trainees, and um, don't hesitate to ask and to learn more. And I would encourage everyone to do it, how to improve your skills. The secret is by believing in yourself and to do it. Uh, in family medicine, we have uh, many procedures and many skills we can do, but it is depending on you, on how and in any level you want to improve yourself and in any level you want to practice family medicine. Uh, some might just see the most common things, diabetes, hypertension, and others might want to practice more. And I will encourage you to do it encourage you to believe in yourself. And this is the way 
that we will improve the family medicine as a whole in the community and you will help your colleagues to make the community understand that we can do more every time so do it and practice it and now i want to share with you some of the solutions that and the ways we did before as a razi young doctor movements in jordan to improve the family medicine speciality in the region so we did many scientific days to um, discuss and to present a new uh, um, articles in your journals and new topics in family medicine uh, for the medical students and for the family medicine residents uh, to improve their knowledge and to emphasize on the importance of family medicine. And here are a webinar that we did for the Jordanian board. It is an example after finishing the family medicine residency. We did a workshop to um, help the residents in their way in uh, doing the family medicine uh, board Jordanian examination. Uh, so uh, it needs uh, every effort from each one of us in the community and in this field to build uh, to a ground uh, for the future. And we did uh, many workshops and campaigns for the community so that they will know what we do and they will know that family medicine doctor can do much many more that we might think or know and to understand the importance of seeing and referring for the family physicians at the first place before seeing any other specialist and we can help them uh, uh, throughout their uh, medical conditions whatever they were seeking help for and we routinely do uh, like uh, meetings with other specialities and attendings from uh, the, the older generation and the new generation of family doctors. So we can share our uh, perspective and our ideas on improving family medicine. And we can share our knowledge and uh, we will get many informations and useful ways to improve this family medicine specialty in Jordan and in the region by the guidance of our attendees and specialists as well. So uh, the last but not the least, I want to emphasize on this quote that the good physician treats the disease, but the great physician treats the patient who has the disease. And this is our role as a family physicians. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Moran. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jihad. Uh, anyone have any question? I'd like uh, to thank all our speakers and all our attendees. Uh, and uh, Dr. Sanka, are you here? Yes, yeah. Got you. Uh, Give thanks to you, Dr. Sanka. Do you want to uh, give any thoughts? Uh, am I audible? No, no, I can't hear you, Dr. Sang. So thank you, thank you. You can close the mic and open again. Maybe it will connect because we used to hear. What about now? I think there's a bit of a. a... Great. That's great. Yes, yes. Okay, okay. You. Sorry. I think there's a, some internet issue. However, um, I thank you all, especially uh, Al Razi Moment, 
uh, for handling this webinar, organizing everything on behalf of the Young Doctors Movement, as well as the Wonka Working Party on Education. Uh, we have two uh, liaisons, Young Doctor liaisons now in the working, working Party on Education. So I'm really grateful to them, Bola and uh, Brune. Uh, and also uh, to, the, to all the resource persons for this excellent uh, webinar. Thank you very much uh, and have a great day. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Anas, uh, Chair of our Razi YDM. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jihad, uh, uh, Dr. Adel, all of our uh, panelists today for this uh, nice uh, uh, webinar about perspectives on education. Uh, it was an interesting uh, talks from uh, all of you uh, and, and sharing these experiences all over the globe is really uh, interesting and useful. Uh, thank you for joining us and helping us uh, in collaboration with uh, Education Working Party to, to uh, um, excel or uh, to, to have the, this successful webinar. Thanks, thank you also. Uh, I'd like to thank you all, uh, our speakers, our translators, uh, Dr. Chen Lam, Family Medicine Specialist, Hong Kong, the Chinese uh, translator, and Dr. Uh, Nelka Benama, the Spanish translator. Uh, thank you for all uh, our attendees. I hope um, uh, you have, uh, you have um, a nice time with us and waiting for the next webinar. Thanks all. Thank you, everyone. If you can just take a moment for a group photo. If you want to participate, please open your camera. Okay. One, two. Thank you everyone for participating. Adel, Adel, you have to open your camera, please. Yeah, my cameras are not connected. No. Okay. No. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Ayat. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so bye-bye. Bye. Thank you very much.